thank you to the Life Sciences Outreach Center for hosting us. My name is Bjorn Brooks, and I'm one of the co-founders of Perceptual Informatics. Chances are you've not heard of us yet, so let me give you a little background. Uh, we are an environmental and data science startup founded in 2018, and uh, we focus on entrepreneurship and science. We translate environmental risk into economic intelligence. Uh, we've been awarded an AI for Earth grant from Microsoft to support research into developing agricultural risk models at the micromarket level and uh, with respect to climate change. Um, what I'm going to focus on in this talk, though, um, will be how we have found ways just broadly to translate our research into entrepreneurship. Um, we hear, we tend to hear a lot about science in, in the news, uh, but how, uh, how do and how can these efforts make their way into commerce and decision making? We have a couple of uh, nascent partnerships and agreements for developing solutions in areas like deforestation and risk mapping of climate extremes in agribusiness. But what I'm gonna present on today is based on a small smart city planning project that we developed as a demonstration and exploration of what's possible uh, in this sort of zone between uh, science and commerce. Uh, with regard to our team, we are led by Ted Bradley, who, whose background in technology uh, application development and uh, risk. Um, he has contributed to consumer software applications, uh, reaching as many as a quarter billion users, as well as utilizing machine learning to automate and mitigate uh, risk for a Fortune 50. Uh, also, there is uh, Jacob Hiracek. He's our resident financial guru. He has experience in a wide range of aspects of finance and accounting from uh, startups to Fortune 50s. Um, and then lastly, myself, my background's in biology and geology. My work is cross-disciplinary. Um, it sort of bridges uh, environment science and computing. Um, each of us uh, has our own separate uh, day job. And um, for example, I'm a research associate at the North Carolina Institute for Climate Studies located in Asheville, uh, where I work regularly with scientists from NOAA and the USDA Forest Service. Um, what uh, we're going to show uh, today is going to be um, sort of the distillation of, of, of years of thinking and interaction, interacting and observing about um, aspects that are um, somewhat uh, um, open, I guess, and um, uh, available in this realm of translating science into sort of tangible, actionable uh, information. So, um, what do we do? Uh, we leverage peer-reviewed data sources and collaborate with scientists and experts to develop risk products that make it easy to understand the economic impact of environmental change. So think of things like uh, uh, ever increasing climate extremes uh, with each year um, uh, and what are going to be the cost of those sorts of climate extremes. Some examples of the tools that we use in, include things like Azure Maps for geospatial analysis, uh, machine learning tools to develop uh, complex data models to predict future risk. And um, uh, we also use services that uh, help us uh, develop and deploy scalable APIs for uh, clients. So regarding, um, so that's a little bit about sort of the, the tools that we use. Uh, the other behind the scenes aspect of things are the data sources. So examples of those uh, include stuff like climate model data from the Earth System Grid Federation, uh, satellite imagery, uh, and um, information from USDA Economic Research Service, just to name a few. And so those two sorts of things are, are what's happening in the background. And, and there's really not much new about that. There's, um, you have your data sources, you have your tools and stuff. Uh, but really where the innovation comes in and where there's um, 
the, the ground is, is ripe for research and, and sort of uh, co-developing um, products and stuff that has to do with how you combine and present those things in, in frameworks and in platforms that are useful to planners and policy makers and, and decision makers and, and all sorts of people. Um, so today, um, as an example, I'll just be briefly discussing some of the um, work that we've done behind the scenes for one of the demos that we put together on top of Azure Maps. So who would use these kinds of applications? Well, this has multiple roots, but basically it stems from working with stakeholders and policymakers over the years and the observation that they're often very interested in particular data products and risk models. Uh, but without that expert or data scientist there to walk them through things, uh, they weren't necessarily getting the most out of the products that were being produced. So uh, while there was a, um, in other words, they weren't able to sort of dynamically explore and engage the data resources themselves and sort of develop as rich of an understanding of uh, the products as we would have liked or at least that was our observation. The final products weren't necessarily easy to understand. They weren't necessarily very interactive and they uh, didn't really convey the same meaning to uh, the stakeholders as they did to the scientists. So uh, to give you an example, uh, if you really want to engage an agricultural producer in a discussion about climate extremes, about risk, about economic impacts, you're probably better off starting from the realization that they uh, operate on a season ahead calendar when it comes to decision making. Uh, producers are making decisions today about how much fuel and crop inputs and insurance uh, that they will consume and utilize next season. So uh, while they're very interested in uh, weather information, the seasonal weather outlooks don't do much to aid their understanding about the risks that are posed to their harv by harvest by things like drought and flood and other climate extremes uh, relative to the history of what they have experienced. So the same can be said for aspects of city planning when it comes to snow removal and green space planning, uh, air quality and things like that. So oftentimes there's excellent tools and solutions that already exist uh, but these are not always framed in a way that helps a decision maker understand the, the risks or choose between A and B and understand the relative risk that each carries. So um, now I'd like to jump straight in and walk you through the, the relevance of city planning, I think, in general. And then we'll wrap up with a, a demo of the Smart City Dashboard. And um, that uh, should sort of give you a feel uh, for at, or an example of um, the kinds of early stage tools that we like to develop when we're sort of initiating these conversations uh, that help to create sort of a greater understanding and, and uh, help us to jumpstart conversations and understand what um, stakeholder goals are. Okay, so smart city planning. Uh, so I have a few images up here that sort of give you an idea of uh, various different factors that go into city planning, different, you know, uh, different socioeconomic demographics and, and um, environmental factors and stuff. And so uh, we, of course, approach the smart city planning uh, from a bit of a different viewpoint because we're not civil engineers or city planners or the like. Uh, we simply wanted to test the extent to which it was possible to integrate some of our environmental and weather data source offerings uh, with sort of a broad selection of city data collected at the neighborhood level. So uh, this represents to some extent the, the portability across topics of these kinds of methods. And it suggests that uh, there's uh, a diversity of applications for scientific data when developed uh, in the commercial cloud with the advantage of mapping platforms. So uh, why is city planning uh, crucial now? Um, well, uh, first of all, by the year 2050, the United Na Nations predicts that 68% uh, of the world population will live in urban settings. This puts a tremendous strain on cities that are 
seeking not only to meet existing demands and phase out legacy infrastructure, but also to buffer their plans for even more intense municipal use demands. A number of problems will come of this, uh, the least list of which includes the urban heat island effect, uh, threats from storm surges, sea level rise in many of our coastal cities, uh, coastal inundation, air quality, uh, and epidemiological concerns, including asthma, seasonal allergies, and disease transmission. Um, uh, that's a very relevant topic today. I, I, I think uh, this certainly isn't the spring that we expected to find ourselves in, um, but here is, here is an area where um, city planning uh, and thinking about the ways that um, you organize things in the city can, can really um, um, lead to sort of some important problem solving. So all of this sort of needs to be balanced. Uh, and you, meanwhile, you need to ensure that uh, you provide equitable access to healthy living options and green spaces and neighborhoods. Um, another way of thinking about this is if we can't see the problem, then how can we address it? Uh, and it's also worth pointing out that this is not just about mapping, um, but uh, it's actually more about visualizing the most relevant information within a framework that's intuitive. And it sort of encourages exploration and interaction with the data uh, we found that to be a key way to facilitate problem solving and really to get better decision making uh, to make that a, a sort of a reality. Um, so uh, while I won't get into all the data sources and tools uh, that are listed on the left, um, I will talk about some interesting, uh, uh, a few interesting ones that highlight some of what was different about our approach to building a city planning tool um, and and what we decided to uh, uh, adapt and take from other areas and bring bring into um, city planning so we actually wanted to adapt a satellite remote sensing tool that was uh, designed for forestry to look at city blocks and uh, we got some interesting results um, but uh, first, a little bit about uh, satellite remote sensing tools. So uh, the principal one that we use for this project is called Synthetic Aperture Radar, or just radar. So if you look at the uh, image on the far right, it shows both a true color and a radar representation of an agricultural and natural forest landscape uh, with clouds and, and water. Uh, radar is simply just a method of imaging the terrain of the Earth's surface. So instead of radar blips, as we see in the movies, the backscatter data is reprocessed to create imagery that reflects the roughness of the terrain. So if you look at the backscatter diagram um, image in the, uh, in the upper right, um, you see some examples of some uh, blue and red and uh, arrows that are bouncing off of different objects on the terrain. Um, so that, that interaction with the Earth's surface um, leads to different backscatter returns that are received by the satellite. So whether the terrain is covered in trees or water and gra or grass or concrete, the radar can distinguish among those and it can even tell you if there was change between successive passes by the satellite. Furthermore, the radar works well in all weather, whether it's rain or shine, day or night. Uh, what we did was we spent some time testing and training our remote sensing algorithms, doing research into that in order to cleanly distinguish the trees from other urban features like grass and concrete and umbrellas. Um, and with, uh, with this, uh, we also use some cloud computing tools to, uh, in order to sort of turn this around a little more quickly um, and then uh, produced an image that we're able to drape over the top of the map. Um, so I'll show you a little bit about that um, in, a, in a moment. So um, I also might mention that radar is good at detecting other things like uh, flooding, for example. Um, so um, let's go ahead and 
jump right in and take a look at the um, interactive Smart City dashboard. And I'll sort of walk you through um, uh, how we might uh, engage uh, a stakeholder in a conversation about, um, about city planning, for example. So uh, here we are. And this is the Smart City dashboard. This was actually produced uh, for uh, Microsoft, who de who demoed this at the uh, Smart City World Expo in Barcelona this past uh, November. Um, the uh, objective of this was to uh, quickly sort of uh, demonstrate um, the capacity to um, integrate some uh, near real time and and some some um, not, not just near real time, but also very granular data sources, environmental data sources, along with demographic data sources uh, and uh, sort of municipal use data sources. And to sort of put those all together in, um, in a sort of a package that demonstrates uh, how some of these information sources can be used to aid in decision making uh, that's, that's done. So in other words, city planning, civil engineers and and uh, the Chamber of Commerce and, and that. Okay, so um, right off the bat, you can see that this is a, a very um, uh, interactive tool. And so you can uh, navigate around the landscape, you can find locations of interest, you can click on them, you can pull up information about them, um, and you can sort of do some exploring. And that's really, uh, the, the basis for a lot of learning. These are very interactive uh, tools. So what I've set up initially here is, um, so you're actually looking at two different maps uh, using the slider. So um, on the left side, we have demographic data that shows you the number of men in each neighborhood district. Each one of these polygons is a neighborhood district. And uh, it has a certain count of men. For example, uh, this one right here, it looks like uh, uh, 25,000, more than 25,000, or, or more than 20,000 in this particular neighborhood there, we're underneath my mouse pointer. Uh, so that's men, and we can quickly compare that to women, and it looks like there's a, there are more women in that particular neighborhood at the bottom center than men. Uh, and so we can look, scan across the uh, city for differences and whether or not they're significant. Um, so um, that's that's interesting. But we we also want to look at uh, uh, more nuance information. For example, uh, uh, dem age demographics and trends too are also important too. So what what is the trend over time of uh, different demographic? Um, aspects of the city. So um, on the left here, we have just simply age. So this is, um, this is age on the left. And we'll zoom out just slightly. Uh, so we can see that there are differences across the city of Barcelona in terms of the average age. Uh, while most of the neighborhoods, it uh, seems has an average age of about 40 years old. There are some that are younger. This, uh, this area right here is an average age of between 36 and 40. Um, there's some younger pockets in other areas. And on the right, what we have is um, the uh, trend, basically, whether or not a neighborhood is trending toward uh, getting older or getting younger on the whole or doing nothing at all, or if it's relatively unchanged over time. Uh, so what is the trend of that population? Are, are, are the people tending to, are we see, you're seeing more, whether that be older people moving into the neighborhood or just uh, not seeing as much replacement from new births coming behind um, from, from families. So like right here in the center, we see something interesting. So this neighborhood right here, right here sort of in the, uh, bottom left corner. Uh, this neighborhood is, is quite young. It looks like it's 
average age is quite young, it's bright green, but also the trend is toward a negative, it is toward a declining age, or, or I guess younger. So not only is it a young neighborhood, but it's getting younger as time goes on. Uh, that's uh, different from some of these other young neighborhoods up here uh, across uh, the, I guess, northeastern corner of Barcelona. You have several of these other bright green neighborhoods. Um, however, they have either no trend or very little trend um, in their age. Uh, some of them over here, like this one particularly, has a trend toward uh, getting older, it looks like. So this, this neighborhood is, is young, but the trend is toward getting older. So, you know, that uh, this gives you, this would give a, a planner um, uh, some idea about where the, the, where they might want to look if they were trying to understand family dynamics or um, uh, other aspects of city planning. So, um, and we also have a variety of other um, metrics that we put in here, including municipal water usage and hookups and also air quality data. But I wanted to show you um, uh, one more layer that's based on the radar that I uh, mentioned earlier. So this is uh, a synthetic aperture uh, radar product that we put together for the city of Barcelona. And um, as I mentioned earlier, we, we, we uh, spent some time doing research into trying to adapt this tool to work on city landscapes. And so what we have now is an image of what we're interested in is uh, for uh, green space access and, and particularly in trees and tree canopies. So not just grass and um, uh, not necessarily just whether or not there's green vegetation or house or, or plants there, but whether or not there's a, a tree canopy. And so this is our, our green zone buffer layer. And um, it shows you by the the, the intensity of the green, the darker the green, the more intense it is, it shows you just how deep the uh, canopy is in a, in a particular area. So one thing you can notice from this level is that a, um, a lot of the uh, canopy is following, as you would expect, uh, the streets. So it's following the sidewalks and the streets. And so it's very regular within the city, outside of the city, you see uh, the, the trees, and the canopy is just draping the, the hillside and the landscapes. We also have uh, a lot of green around the, the rivers down here, and it's able to distinguish that kind of greenery from uh, just grass greenery, um, open grass fields. Uh, so as we sort of zoom in, uh, we can get a better idea about um, what's going on here at sort of the neighborhood level, and we can see that um, uh, parks. Here's a here's a baseball field. Here's a uh, some other kind of field. Uh, we can see that there's there's a high density of trees and canopies around this sort of recreation rich zone in here. Uh, this would give a planner an idea about where they're in uh, where they're doing a good job and perhaps where they need to improve in near real time. So you can get updates. Um, you can update this um, after a major weather event and look at and get a, put together a change layer to look at where there's been disturbance. Um, so yeah, the, the, the point of this, of going through this exercise is to just sort of, to look at things and to understand the context of these multiple different dimensions that go into um, city planning, um, including uh, elements like uh, green space and air quality. And so we just really just wanted to show this to you as as an example of uh, how, of the kind of tool that um, can be produced and that really facilitates this sort of um, um, enterprise of, of co-development of scientific solutions uh, for solving stakeholder problems. Okay, so um, Back to the slideshow. Let's see. And let's see if I can get back to the slideshow. And 
there we are. Okay, um, so that I hope was uh, kind of neat and interesting to look around. Feel free to visit uh, that URL if you if you'd like. Um, as I mentioned, that's um, that's just sort of a tool that um, is uh, a useful um, uh, resource to sort of initiate conversations and to um, to sort of tailor and develop uh, products that are useful to the particular um, audience that you're um, that you're working with. And I think it's sort of a good example of how you take sort of cutting edge science and environmental remote sensing and products like that, and you sort of put that in the hands of uh, policymakers and stakeholders and, and give it to them in a way that allows them to um, explore and, and to utilize sort of the latest, uh, latest science. So, um, uh, in closing, I, uh, like to say that we really enjoyed, uh, working with, uh, partners like Microsoft and Clemson and the Forest Service to, uh, frame solutions that can help stakeholders visualize risk and translate that into inform decision-making and economic intelligence. Um, I, I would also like to say that um, the, the tools like this are becoming ever more, I think, relevant today, particularly with what we're going through um, in this global pandemic. Uh, being able to visualize in a, the information that's changing on, on a daily basis um, requires both spatial tools like we showed you, but also the, the cloud computing infrastructure behind it to, um, to sort of serve up the data very quickly and to have these processes accessible and scalable to, to large groups. And so we're actually very interested in that. And, and uh, we have sort of a nascent project developing in that vein that's uh, looking at ways that we might be able to contribute to the conversation um, that's being had in many places throughout the country about how to deal with COVID-19 and how do you put resources in the places that they need to be? Where do where do those um, uh, where do those um, resources need to be? Where uh, where are where are folks suffering and that sort of stuff? So anyway, uh, thank you very much for your time and uh, feel free to contact us um, and. Perhaps uh, we'll look forward to doing another uh, talk on a, uh, on a different topic in the future. Thanks.